This afternoon I'm with uh, John talking about the uh, Timber Creek case. Talking about the uh, Timber Creek case, uh, which has got a certain number of ramifications for, I think, many of the uh, customary land issues that we've been both involved with, both particularly yours here in Australia, but also potential ramifications for uh, what's going on in um, uh, wider concerns of customary land, given the, um, the fact that for the first time we've, we seem to have recognition through the highest court in Australia of um, the dynamic of what has been called the cultural value. Um, so perhaps to start off with, can you just give us a potted history of, of what's happened in Timber Creek? The recent High Court decision in Timber Creek was somewhat uh, unexpected, but at the same time there were elements of it which uh, were indicating to many of us that the, uh, the way in which the methodology for the assessment of compensation for native title, when it's actually uh, extinguished, uh, is going to be dealt with in accordance with established property law and certainly property compensation law and practice. It took 10 years for the, uh, for the Timber Creek case to, to get to the High Court. It first of all went in front on a single judge in the Federal Court, Justice Mansfield, who really set the parameters for what the, the full Federal Court and then the High Court had to confirm or deny. What occurred with Justice Mansfield was that he recognised that there was a significant component of native title which fell within the area of what we might call spiritual and cultural attachment. He allocated a certain figure to that which was 1.3 million and quite aside from the other two components which is the economic value of the land and of course the statutory interest component, uh, the component of native title which is of great interest to all of us particularly in the area of when we're dealing with compensation law and practice for customary and traditional land titles is that particular aspect. How do we quantify the spiritual and cultural component of such property rights to a point that, as the High Court has indicated, it meets the requirements of Section 5131 of the Constitution, that is, that the compensation demonstrates that uh, it is on just terms. One of the issues that the High Court addressed was obviously the question of just how you might do that, that assessment. There had been a reaffirmation in both the fe full Federal Court and certainly in the High Court's decision that uh, a method which perhaps lies in the, the more traditional aspect, albeit a very small aspect of how we do compensation for non-Indigenous property rights, and that is using solatium, the principle of solatium, which is for those unquantifiable losses which still are incurred by the dispossessed owner but are only assessed at a very, very small component, perhaps a couple of percent of the overall figure for compensation as assessed for the non-Indigenous property rights involved. One of the points that the High Court makes, particularly in Justice Edelman's own decision of the High Court, not the, not the joint decision, but Justice Edelman's decision, is that he draws a distinction between solatium, which is really coming out of the, the, uh, the compensation legislation, which is really set up to deal with those property rights which emerge out of a Crown grant. And of course, as we well know, native title doesn't emerge out of a Crown grant. It is a pre-existing right which was there at the time of sovereignty being acquired by the uh, Crown. He, he draws the distinction between solatium and what he calls to be the loss of cultural value. To a degree, it's my view that there's little difference between them. There is a distinction. The distinction is solatium is specifically uh, constructed to be part of the compulsory acquisition legislation to deal with, with uh, those property rights which emerge out of a Crown grant. In the case of, uh, of this particular native title compensation assessment, what Justice Edelman does is to conclude that, well look, it does seem very similar to Solatium, but it draws upon Section 5131 of the Constitution, which then allows, which in fact triggers the, the High Court to be able to say, well look, it is very similar, but, but quite separate. In, in legal construction to Solatium as in the land acquisition 
provisions in the Northern Territory legislation. So what was loss of cultural, cultural value? Loss of cultural value in the way in which the High Court overall in the decision, both the joint decision and the separate decision of Justice Edelman, they considered that there was a loss uh, of cultural values, spiritual and cultural values in the hands of the traditional owners as a result of the compulsory acquisition of the various sites at, sites at Timber Creek, which were overall affected by, uh, those values were affected by those compulsory acquisitions. One of the intriguing things about the the Timber Creek case is that there was a number of smallish parcels of land which were then combined together in terms of the way in which the assessment of compensation was treated. Perhaps it would have been an interesting situation if there had been one large homogenous parcel of land and that could have been applied directly looking at perhaps the, the effect of maybe a, a dreaming site as there was on one of the sites we know there uh, off the main road in Timber Creek, not far from the actual uh, where the camping area is uh, in the um, local service station where the Dringo Dreaming site is, that uh, there was a uh, series of examples provided in the High Court's decision, particularly articulated in the, the joint decision in the high, of the High Court, explaining how that particular location, the Dingo Dreaming site, was where the, the um, creation journey of these heroic figures ended, this heroic figure ended up and of course there was damage done to the site of course by the construction of a weir at some time in the past. That damage was seen as being uh, part and parcel of a holistic approach by the High Court to, uh, to compensation, particularly in relation to the loss of uh, spiritual and cultural, primarily cultural values embedded in the native title which was held by the traditional owners. In my own view, there's probably nothing unexpected in the High Court's decision, in the sense that there was no form of new compensation envisaged. It was really solatium by another name. So many times in High Court decisions on native title, there is a reference to the fact that native title is really part of the bundle of rights, which is familiar with how we we look at property rights in Australia. And yet at the same time, the High Court uh, issues the idea of analogies to other more familiar rights and interests. And yet that's exactly the way in which the Court has looked at this again. Apart from the economic value, which was not unexpected, as a trigger to doing the overall compensation assessment, what the High Court has looked at is, well, there is salati in there for dealing with Crown Grant type uh, uh, property rights which are which are extinguished by uh, the action of the state or territory in this case and in this particular situation there is something which is distinctly different from Salatium but markedly similar in the end product. So we have the decision of the joint the joint decision where the judges point out that the act requires compensable acts to be identified but as they point out, the trial judge, Justice Mansfield, indicated that the task is then to determine the essentially spiritual relationship which the traditional owners had with their country and to translate the spiritual hurt caused by the compensable acts into compensation, and in fact, monetary compensation. It's a task which isn't easy. It's a task in which the High Court has, has addressed and now provided us with the framework for how in which future compensation assessments for native title will be dealt. It recognises the two primary property related components of the compensation package. That is the utility or the economic value of the land as a trigger and secondly the way in which we could look at spiritual and cultural losses associated with this, this particular property right, this unique property right which in itself is native title. Thanks John, that was really helpful. One of the things that um, I wanted to ask you is you've been involved with uh, native title assessments for the last 20 years uh, where you've gone in and you've helped customary landowners actually get a, or what can be said is a better deal than they would have done under pre-existing native title legislation and you've, you've often um, discussed with me your reliance on Solatium um, as an overreach, as a, 
as a percentage quite often uh, figure. And here we're seeing something which has, has taken us into a situation where it hasn't been a percentage. Uh, there's been a different quantum. I mean, you seem quite happy with the outcome of the High Court decision. Um, is that because it lends value to the work you've been doing and validates what you've been doing for the last 20 years and also now gives customary landowners something upon which to hang um, positivity going forward in terms of native title uh, compensation? Yes, Mike, look, I am very content with the decision because it uh, has provided two main areas of, of uh, support. First is that we now have we now have some case law which indicates the correct methodology to assess compensation for native title. And yes, secondly, I'm pleased that uh, the particular methodology that I've developed, as you mentioned before, uh, over the last 20 years, uh, it has been validated to a, a degree. I, I think that there's also uh, further information that which you have to slowly uh, understand as we probably end up having some further compensation cases in native title and we'll understand the way in which uh, the actual quantum of compensation is calculated for Salatium cultural value, whatever you might want to call it. I, I think that it's a, it's a moot point to whether or not it's cultural value picking up the need to have just terms compensation which means that we move out of the, the, the freehold constraint uh, contained in 51 and move towards what's in 53 which says that you have to take into account just terms and that's a trigger really that the High Court used to explain why they could have a, an, an additional add-on which really gave the High Court the ability to approve Justice Mansfield's approach. Uh, the other point is that they also speak about consistently the uh, economic value of the land as the starting point for this compensation assessment. We had in a decision, a dissenting decision of just uh, President, uh, Deputy President Kingham in a case some years ago in the Land Tribunal in Queensland which, which hinted towards this being the correct way of starting a native title compensation assessment and I've used that approach by the Deputy President and then subsequently there was of course the South Australian decision in De Rose which clearly pointed out that you have to have a starting point to get to this quantification of the losses as unpalatable as it might be, we do bring things down to a monetary value, we do it in all sorts of areas of compensation and property is no different. And while it might seem really uh, offensive to some people to say, well, you're putting a dollar value on someone's spiritual and cultural values, we do that all the time in the way we deal with compensation in all sorts of other areas of the community. The, courts the psychic value of the people's yes, relationship yes. historically. And, and even in, in, in damages for people in, in personal injury, we, we do have uh, the court having a fairly codified uh, approach to the loss of a finger, the loss of a hand. We put a value on those things. We don't want to lose those parts of our body, but the court does, does take that approach. And I do think that uh, the, the court has uh, been, it's been suggested to the court uh, through the writings of a number of, uh, of people over the years that there may well be a, a new branch of property compensation law and practice to do with native title. I never believe that would be the case. I always believe that the court would take a, a slow and methodical approach to it by saying, well look, it's, it's a property right. It's very clear that it's seen within the, uh, the bundle of rights recognised by the Australian common law and that I think really told us what it was going to be. As I said to you at the outset, I'm not surprised in the decision. I do think though that there are some issues which have, which have to be fleshed out. Uh, Justice Mansfield and subsequently confirmed by the full Federal Court and now the High Court uh, had a figure of 1.3 million for the, uh, the cultural values, the spiritual and cultural values that were hurt and damaged. You know, made distinct from Salatium, but very, very similar to Salatium. But we don't really know how he got to that figure, and the High Court doesn't do that. That's either. what I was going to ask you. Right. Yeah, on, on what basis did yeah. we did we get to a figure of? Well, we're not 1. told. 3 million. We're not told, and and I think one of the interesting is that a good thing, though. Well, I think that it showed the the limitations in the way in which the original federal court case, the single judge case, dealt with it, because. There was evidence provided by, I, I think, a whole range of disciplines which were probably not helpful to His Honour because His Honour was dealing with 
with compensation for a property right, albeit a new ancient but new property right to be dealt with in compensation law and practice. And I think that what happened for Justice Mansfield was he had to make uh, an intuitive decision about what is the, the intensity of the spiritual and cultural attachment and how, how important is it as part of that uh, trilogy of the compensation due to the functional owners. That was an issue for him. I think in fullness of time we will probably get a better understanding. But the court is also talking about how there is a strength of spiritual and cultural attachment which can vary from one location to another. I mean, it's interesting in the, in the judgment, both the single judge and also the, uh, uh, the joint decision in the High Court, both of them are saying, well look, um, in areas where you have very high, va high economic value, you may have very, very minor spiritual and cultural attachment. And you have in other parts of Australia, I'm thinking perhaps in more remote parts of Australia, Western Australia, for example, in the Northwest, where you might have very remote parts of Australia, very, very low economic values, but in fact enormously high spiritual Proportionately. I mean, call with, yeah. the, with the High Court case in, uh, in uh, Ward in Western Australia, where there was uh, a commentary there that um, the, some of the traditional owners were even unaware that their rights and interests had been uh, affected by some decision that was made in colonial times a long, long away from where they lived. And so that really told us that, that those rights and interests were, were really very robust and hadn't been uh, diminished in any way. But do you think the, the quantum is interesting in this case because the, the land component was determined as a percentage of freehold value mm. um, and the in many cases where I know you fought uh, on uh, assessments for a level of solatio, mm. um, it's it's almost been an overage, a percentile figure, uh, which you've managed to uh, convince the the parties to um, an assessment uh, to to show that level of um, support for this cultural, spiritual, religious um, value associated with the. Um, uh, the connection with the land. Justice Mansfield seems to have gone sort of quite out on a limb away from that in terms of previous um, uh, matters which haven't gone to the court. Now he's the first, he's the first uh, justice to have to actually deal with this that's right. in a matter that's gone to court, hasn't been in camera, it hasn't been uh, right. sort of held commercial in confidence between the parties. So do you think that gave him a a clearer slate to to actually say, well, we need to make a, uh, some level of statement here. Yes, I think you're right. Uh, the, the, the as I said before, the, the the issue for Justice Mansfield was the fact, like in all court cases, you rely upon the evidence and the material in front of you, the documentary evidence and the oral evidence in front of you. It seems to me that Justice Mansfield was labouring under a certain difficulty that he wasn't presented with information which was perhaps as helpful as it could have been in terms of trying to understand how he might construct the Salatium special, uh, special value, value, cultural, cultural value, cultural, spiritual yeah. attachments, whatever it might be. And, and so I think that he put a lot of weight on the evidence of the traditional owners about the spiritual and cultural attachment. We know that's the case because in the, the major judgment in the Timber Creek High Court case, the, the judges together spent a lot of time talking about the spiritual and cultural values of the land and how they were affected. They spent a lot of time talking about that aspect of it, where in fact Justice Edelman takes a more mechanistic approach and, and deals with the issue of Salatium and the mm. compensation calculation overall. There's a reason behind that because I think that the High Court understood, as did I think Justice Mansfield, that there isn't any Xerox copy of uh, native title rights and interests, that you have to uh, under uncover what those rights and interests are, particularly the spiritual and cultural aspects of those rights and interests, uh, through oral evidence provided by the traditional owners. They've got to be tested, which they were, and also they have to be supported uh, by other information available such as opinions of anthropologists and what else. And think that's why it's in my view that in the, the major decision in, 
Greek uh, High Court case is that what they've done is spent quite a lot of time explaining how deep the spiritual and cultural attachment was and how it had still outlasted the impact of European settlement in Timber Creek. To me that was quite an important uh, uh, exposition of the way in which compensation will be assessed in the future when we're dealing with uh, native title being extinguished or impaired. It's going to tell us what is going to be the trigger for then forming a view about the intensity of the spiritual and cultural attachment and that will enable us to say well in some parts of Australia where there's just a sliver of spiritual and cultural attachment in other parts of Australia the compensation assessment in terms of the salatium or the spiritual and cultural value is going to be so intense it may significantly outweigh very much so the economic value of the land and I think it's fairly obvious the way the court's been approaching it. The, the commentary in the press John has, has largely focused on the uh, cultural dimension which is a major component obviously for ramifications it has potentially um, uh, relevance to the work we, we're looking at in the Pacific as well. Um, but what about the economic dimensions of this case? Uh, that's been underplayed by the, uh, by the press uh, and media reportage. Um, any, any observations on that? Yes, Mike, thanks for that question because um, it, it does appear to me that there's been a lack of understanding about the way in which the court is looking at that aspect. See, the court is looking at the land acquisition legislation in the Northern Territory and it talks about the market value, and they are looking at just that. We know in all the land acquisition legislation, be it the Land Acquisition Just Terms Compensation Act in New South Wales or whatever the uh, territory or the state legislation, they talk about the market value and that I see is where the court is, is looking at the issue of economic value. But market value, economic value isn't just simply the worth of the estate, in the case of a freehold interest, which is a, something coming out of a Crown Grant. We know that there is subdivisions of that. We know that why, why there might be, for example, a dollar attached to the, to, the, to, the, to the basic freehold value. There are extra bits attached to that freehold value, which also add value to that, economic, that basic economic value. For example, you could have uh, some land which has the benefit of an access over some other land to gain another benefit. So that in itself isn't part of the actual freehold value of that, but there is some extra component in there which has to be worked in. And, and I think that's something that's going to have to be explored uh, in the future. I, I tend to think that in my own work over the last 20 years I've come to the view that there, there are some ancillary rights and interests which are attached to that economic or that market value which I think will be explored in due course in the, uh, the further uh, obviously court cases that will occur in native title. It's a bit simplistic at the moment to talk simply about economic value, well that's just the market value mm -hmm. of economic interest, it's more than that. But I think we're, we're in early days, but we do know yet again that the court has looked at that for many, many years about the idea of what is the hands, what is the value in the hands of the, uh, of the holder of the property right, albeit a non-Indigenous property right isn't just the market value. We know there's other things which are attached to that to produce the overall market value, such as special value to the owner, mm. and, and those sorts of things which are there. Uh, and I think that we're going to see that develop over time also. So it isn't just a very simplistic view that there's a dollar value for the uh, freehold value, and that's all there is. There's subtlety in that which hasn't been articulated yet. It's because I think the court had to do with a very difficult issue of trying to establish a framework for dealing with spiritual and cultural attachment and that's been the basis of the main focus. Good, that's right. I think one of the important things for people watching this, uh, I think the world's attention, particularly customary landowners' attention, globally will be beyond this. Do you think um, you know, there's going to be ramifications or benefits or opportunities created in other jurisdictions, and here I'm thinking about particularly the Pacific, but it could also be um, the US or any indigenous indigenous areas um, where we're, we've been fighting long uh, for the for advocacy and uh, a voice for uh, customary landowners. Um, do you think there are, there are lessons from this case for other jurisdictions? Yes, I think there are. I, I, some years ago I was approached by a, a lawyer from Canada 
he indicated to me that uh, in Canada, where of course, as you know, the Canadian Supreme Court and the Australian High Court have exchanged uh, uh, references to case law a number of times. The Calder case, Delvinwick, of course, in Canada, uh, Marbo, Wick here has been informative, uh, not only in Canada, but also the Malaysian court. In other words, courts of uh, that jurisdictional level uh, dealing in the common law. Canada is interesting because they've always steered away from uh, an approach which could be helpful to doing assessments of compensation. I know that because I was uh, approached, as I said before, by a lawyer trying to get some information about how we were approaching compensation. I had to indicate to him that we didn't have any uh, case law to support the work. I knew that it would be probably ending up in the position that it's in now, where we do have some direction from the High Court. And I'm almost certain, in fact I am certain, that the situation in Canada will be informed by this. Other common law jurisdictions, particularly those that have got uh, a, a, a land tenure pattern which is overwhelmingly traditional or customary, as you mentioned before, the Pacific, and I'm thinking even in, in, in Africa, for example, particularly East Africa, common law countries, Kenya, Uganda, and that. I think that there will be a great deal of value attached to the, to the case in their view because it represents, I think, a very a very calm and measured approach to just how compensation is assessed. They've looked at all sorts of issues which are obviously presented to them. Uh, traditionally, I know that there's been uh, a lot of commentary on the basis that, well, how could you possibly put a dollar value on someone's spiritual and cultural attachment? It happens, and it has happened here, and it's happened at a definitive level. And that, I think, will be what will inform the other jurisdictions. I'm absolutely certain that uh, the Canadian Supreme Court will be aware of these things, and I'm certain that the uh, Malaysian courts will be aware of those things. And, and I think that you will see also some of the courts in East Africa that take those into account. Um, Papua New Guinea, New Guinea, Fiji, and some of the other uh, Pacific countries, I think it would be interesting there because they've got uh, somewhat different uh, approach to, uh, to the value of uh, traditional rights and interests and I think that there has been uh, a, a growth away from the rather more codified and systemic approach that's been adopted in Australia. I, I do think one of the limiting factors in the decision will be the fact that Section 223 of the Native Title Act puts parameters around what is Native Title and what's not. And that's something that doesn't necessarily exist in, in other countries. That's an issue which will be somewhat ameliorating in the other jurisdictions we're looking at. Good, that's very helpful. We'll put links to the, um, to the case in the description below.